verses, verses 7 and 9 from chapter 18, we talked about the three kinds of renunciation. And just to briefly summarize, sattvic renunciation would be when one renounces the fruit and not the action. One does performs the duty but does not get attached. The rajasic renunciation is due to fear or due to suffering. And tamasic renunciation is when one abandons one's duties duties that one is actually obliged to fulfill. The following verses, 10 to 12, continue to explain a little bit about this renunciation or um, sannyasa. I'm reading verses 10 to 12. A relinquisher possessed of mental essence, endowed with intuitive wisdom, with his doubts dispelled, neither hates the unhappy deed nor is drawn to the happy act. It is not at all possible for a body bearer to abandon acts in their entirety. He However, who relinquishes the fruits of action is said to be the relinquisher. The fruit of action is threefold, undesirable, desirable and mixed. Such fruit occurs after death to those who do not relinquish, but to the renunciates there is none. First, let me remind you briefly that right in the beginning of this chapter, which is called Moksha Sanyas Yoga, the very first verses explained what sanyasa means. And we said that according to the Bhagavad Gita, the definition of sanyasa is Vairagya. That is, renouncing the actual attachment. It doesn't mean renouncing the, the object itself. So such a renunciate is also known as a vairagi, while one who renounces only the objects may or may not be attached to those objects as yet, such a person is, is forming thyaga. So here, the Bhagavad Gita talks about a renunciate, the one who has done vairagya. So whether the action is pleasant, whether the fruit is pleasant or unpleasant or mixed, a person who has vairagya is remains unaffected. Such a person does not gather any merit, nor does he gather demerit. Others do. Others then gather merit or demerit according to the action. One who has performed this uh, renunciation with the spirit of Vairagya. He is one who is endowed with wisdom. He has sattva, the quality of sattva. Complete tyaga, complete renunciation of fruit is not really possible. You know, you can renounce all possible things, but ultimately you still have a body. And one who is in the body, a body bearer, needs to perform some sort of action. He may have to just eat some food, but that's also a form of action. He will end up communicating in some way or the other 
to the environment and world around him. So, complete renunciation is not possible. There have been throughout history many attempts made by very um, strict renunciates who have performed Tyaga externally having made attempts to completely stop performing all action and has led to very strained situations. Complete recluse, living a com life of a complete recluse. Hermits, they have cut themselves off completely from society, lived on absolute substance, basic needs, and still they find that they, they cannot renounce completely. That is not possible. And this brings such a seeker to the realization, to the insight, that what is really required is vairagya, where you can perform action, but no merit nor demerit will accrue to you. So this was an elaboration of the different kinds of renunciation. And the following verses elaborate that a little bit further. Unless somebody has questions right now, I would just like to continue to the next set of verses which are related. Verses 13 to 15. Learn these five causes from me, O mighty armed one, taught in Sankhya, where all actions end for the fulfillment of all actions. The substratum, the agent of action and instrumentality of different kinds, separate motions of various kinds and the rulership of the deities as the fifth. The actions that a human initiates with the body, speech and mind, whether just or is opposite, these five are its causes. When a renunciate attempts to give up all actions, what are these actions? What are the components of this action? So these three verses are studying in greater detail what action is. Action comprises of five parts or five factors. The first one is the body. In earlier chapters, we have referred to the body, the Bhagavad Gita refers to the body as Kshetra, as a field. So when you perform an action, there has to be a field where it is performed. The body is the field. If there is a place where the action is performed, there also has to be one who performs it. Therefore, the doer comes into place and that is Atman. Atman is the doer. The center of consciousness is the doer. We are not talking about Hankara who has usurped this role. Here we are referring to the doer as Atman, center of consciousness. Then comes the instruments which we use to do the action, which are mainly the senses, including manas and ahankara, which identifies, interrelates with the environment around. The fourth factor, 
are all the efforts that we put into performing these the action can be different kinds of effort required for any action effort is required even if the other factors are there and there's no effort there cannot be much action so effort is an important prerequisite and the fifth and final is faith or divine providence what is referred to here as a rulership of deities daivam is nothing other than fate or destiny you have acquired certain karma some scars in previous previous lifetimes and this will unfold in this lifetime unless you are able to change your fate and when that unfolds you may acquire a certain kind of body you may be born into a certain kind of background you may receive a certain kind of education these are factors you cannot influence you cannot influence them until a certain age as long as you are a child you are dependent on your surroundings if you're born in a certain family which is very privileged things life is very easy and if you are not born in a privileged family things are very different if you're born in a war torn country life can be very hard but if you're born in a country which is at the height of its development in times of peace you will have a different environment so this is the general environment fate providence destiny whatever you like to call it and all these three factors determine the action and the action may lead may be either proper or improper so you use the body the speech the mind and all these things to perform the action which may be proper or improper so this is a kind of analysis of action and why is this important we will find out as we continue but in the meantime if anybody has any questions comments doubts about anything here before we continue no okay in that case we just continue to verses 16 17 so we have now analyzed what action is we have understood what vairagya is what what tyaga is having understood this we read verses 16 and 17 this being the reality he who sees only the self as the agent because he has not cultivated his wisdom such a dull wit does not see he who does not have the sentiment produced by the thought i whose intelligence is not defiled even upon killing these beings 
he neither kills nor is bound. Upon studying the details of action, five factors which lead to action, to briefly summarize, the five, five factors are body, the doer, the instruments, effort and divine providence. In spite of knowing this, if you think only the doer is the act, the, 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 the one who is responsible for the action, then you have not seen the reality carefully. You have not understood this reality. It's become very fashionable lately by a lot of people who understand, uh, intellectually understand Advaita. They always say, oh, I'm not the doer. I'm not the doer. And while that is theoretically true, they do not have that insight. They have not studied, had a direct insight into action, into the world around them. And they are merely parroting the words, I am not the doer. For such people, they are in fact attached to the action and for them this does not hold true. And for the one who has this direct experience, for him it is really true that only Atman is the doer. And such a one is free. Such a one is attain the state of Param Vairagya, absolute non attachment, and he is free. Neither merit nor demerit will accrue to him. This verse 17 can also be interpreted in a way that is dangerous. For those who begin to think in a deluded manner, they delude themselves that they are not the doer and they believe whatever I do is not going to accrue to me therefore I can do anything I want. The verse says even upon killing the beings he neither kills nor is bound. This seems like a license to do what you want. Do you see the inherent danger in misinterpreting and misunderstanding these verses? And that unfortunately has, has, has happened where many deluded beings, people, get into this idea of Advaita, such people Laterly, have one calls them neo advaitites, and they keep saying, "I'm not the doer. I'm not the doer. I'm in, I'm continuously meditating. I'm not affected by anything. All they have done in reality is just put on another mask on themselves, mask of spiritual spirituality, mask of a meditator. And those people, in fact, are known as." mithyacharis or pretenders but they could be very dangerous 
because when this is interpreted in this manner, such people can take this as a license to do what they want. This is why most scriptures have always insisted on purification. This is why most scriptures begin with the simple ideas of yamas and niyamas. You know, the yamas are non-violence, satya, don't harm, speak the truth, the ideas of non-stealing, as they are, or practice of brahmacharya, or non-possessiveness. Because if this particular verse is misunderstood, it's a license to harm, a license to lie, a license to, to steal, a license to lead a very decadent, indulgent life and a license to be a complete materialistic and decadent person. Therefore, the emphasis on purification. Therefore, the emphasis on a pure lifestyle. All these teachings were earlier guarded by the custodians who um, did not teach these things to everybody. And the idea was that it would be not misused. And when one learns from a unbroken lineage, a teacher from, an, from a lineage which is unbroken, then one is systematically led into correct interpretation. And of course, such a teacher will ensure that his students are first purified before they attain. One who attains before he is purified is a danger, an absolute menace to society. Any further comments or questions about this? Yes, Manisha. When it says killing these beings. By the way, you know you can also speak, right? I mean, you don't have to use the chat. <laughs> Um, he is referring at that point of time uh, to Arjuna who is standing there between the two armies and saying I don't want to kill my relatives and so he is referring to these beings as in the relatives who are gathered at the battlefield and says if you are truly free, if you have attained to Parambaragya, absolute non-attachment, then you are not bound. You don't really kill anybody. You 
because in reality everybody is eternal and even the act of killing will not bind such a person does that answer the question um hmm you see a person who has attained param vairagya he would not <laughs> he would not do that <laughs> for the simple reason that you're going to be enjoying the show <laughs> i'm putting this in a very funny way because when you are witnessing all the time you witness everything you you find it's like watching you know when you go to the theater you watch a beautiful play or a musical or you go to the movies you know it's it's not real you enjoy it even if you watch a movie which is violent a lot of bloodshed you know it's not real and there's a certain suspense and there's a thriller it's all very exciting so we like to entertain ourselves by watching movies or going to the theater now imagine if you're a witness you don't need to go to movies anymore because you're witnessing all the time it's like watching a movie all the time you don't get involved you don't fall into you know those um the, the, you don't get caught up in the emotions and it's such a good show it's also really 3d and amazing color and great sound better than any any theater any movie hall so it's such a good show there's nothing better than this or why would such a person ever even think about suicide he's just having too much fun <laughs> if you, if if that helps <laughs> apart from the fact that you're having too much fun there is still another little matter and that is the being a witness being established in divinity you are divine and the body is then a temple and it's sacred it's just a beautiful playground for you to live out desires so really the thought would not occur to you but as a kind of a um thought at the end yet at the same time even in the most unlikely case that such a person would commit suicide let's say he would not commit suicide but he would give his life for somebody else you know to save somebody help somebody in a way sacrifice himself in this case also he would remain free he would be doing it in the state of a witness witnessing and having that bhava okay so that was an important um, little insight into the dangers of misinterpreting the verses and the fact that these teachings and um practices were kept secret gupt secret for thousands of years they were only available to 
those who were accepted by the teachers, who then revealed these teachings and practices step by step as the seeker developed. And that is why even in our tradition we say nadatavyam, 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 which means don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. It means that you need to acquire a certain level of development, emotional understanding, life experience to be able to to uh, grasp this knowledge and use it with integrity and not to abuse it for one's own selfish reasons. Coming to verses 18 and 19, but I would like to first focus on verse 18 because this is an important verse, actually important in meditative terms for those of you who are actually practicing. It's an important little insight in this verse. Knowledge the object of knowledge and the knower. This is the threefold source of impelling action. The instrument, the act and the agent. This is the threefold gathering of action. So there's, to use modern terminology, there is a sort of a input and output, how do you put out knowledge and how do you gather it? And two perspectives of seeing this matter. But more important here is the threefold process. Most of us are maybe used to the idea of an object and subject. For example, in modern science, you have this idea of an object when you conduct an experiment and there's a subject, the scientist, who is then observing the object and making notes. What happens in this object-subject relationship? Where is the focus? If you imagine that you are a scientist performing an experiment in a laboratory, when you're performing that experiment on a, you know, whether it's a chemistry experiment and you're mixing some chemicals, you are focused purely on the objects. Where is the subject in this experiment? Actually, the subject is nowhere. In the experiment. The focus is so entirely on the object that the subject just is irrelevant. And this is exactly how we think in modern life. Our modern society is somehow based more on this object-subject kind of relationship where all the time, we go out in the world and we are only focused on the objects around us. We are not paying much attention to ourselves, to our own feelings, to our emotions, to our reactions. We are very focused on the objects that are externally surrounding us. In the threefold process of knowledge, knowable and knower. They're not two, but they are three now. So there is an object, 
unknowable. There is a knower or the subject. And additionally, there is knowledge that flows and that links these two. And what is that knowledge that links these two? It is nothing other than attention. We are shifting the attention from the object to the subject and to the process of knowing. The focus is no longer just the knowable. By shifting the attention, we gain mastery in the entire process. And the whole, not merely a part, but we get mastery in understanding the whole. Just as we talked about knowledge, knowable and knower, we also talk about knowledge, action and the doer. Similar threefold process. And this is also divided into three parts. So this kind of knowledge which we can acquire from this is also divided into three parts. I will continue to those three parts so that we uh, don't break off from the flow of the idea. And so verses 20 to 22. Oh, sorry, did I miss something? No. No? That whereby one sees a single immutable aspect in all beings undivided in the divided, know that to be sattvic knowledge. When one knows the knowledge and all the separate kinds of aspects, each divided separately among all beings, know that to be rajasic knowledge. That which is attached to a single effect as though it were the entire, without proper reasoning, devoid of essential meaning and reality, and narrow in scope, is said to be tamasic. So here, knowledge is divided, again, similarly into three types. And that is, as usual, of course, tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic. I will start with the sattvic, the, the tamasic first, because this is actually the prevalent form of knowledge surrounding us most of the time in modern society. When we study something in a very narrow and limited way and understand it only in its, not in its, in the whole, and his relationship to the whole, but only in that part, divorced from the rest, that is tamasic. And when you study that little part and consider that to be the whole, that is, is extremely tamasic. Because we cannot study a part without understanding its relationship to the whole. This makes it devoid, really, of real meaning. It, it, it seems to be a meaningless kind of exercise. For this, to explain this, I'd like to use an example that is uh, very common in the entire world. And that is the example of modern medicine. What is happening in modern medicine today? If you have a problem 
with your throat, <clears throat> you go to a doctor who is a, you know, an ENT specialist, and your nose, throat. If you have a problem with your eyes, you go to a doctor who specializes and does only your eyes. He's going to look at your eyes and study them. If you have a heart problem, you will go to a doctor who specializes in heart problems, heart disease. So every part of the body, the body being very complex, every part of the body, there is a certain specialist for that. As if the heart were divorced from the rest of the body, as if the eyes are completely unrelated to the rest of the brain or rest of the body. But this is how modern medicine has been set up. So, if you have a certain problem, stomach problem, they give you a tablet for the stomach. You know, for whatever your stomach pain. But the stomach problems could be related to many things and will also affect many other aspects of your body. Everything is so deeply interconnected and related to each other that you simply cannot take it apart. Yet, that is exactly what has happened. That modern medicine has completely lost the overview and has gone so deep and so na in such a narrow way into certain aspects that, according to the Bhagavad Gita, this kind of knowledge would be considered tamasic. Which, by the way, does not mean that we don't need it. It may have its use in a certain limited sort of way. It's just an example here. Rajasic knowledge is that knowledge where one tends to analyze, divide matters. Such a person would see all beings, all individuals as separate, as separate from each other. We are competing with each other. We have to be afraid of each other. There's a separation. Such a mind, for example, would be very analytical. It's very good at dividing and analyzing things. And such kind of knowledge may have its use as well. But it is all the same, rajasic. These two forms of knowledge, tamasic and rajasic, are quite useful in establishing and continuing the ways of the world. When you want to attain to something higher, vidya, a vidya or knowledge that is of the other shore, known as paravidya, then one needs knowledge that sees that even in that what appears to be divided, there is unity. Such a mind can perform a sort of synthesis, you know, the difference between analysis and th synthesis. In analysis, one breaks up things into its parts. And in synthesis, one tries to bring the parts together, put them together to, to create a, um, a whole, to, to explain the whole. So such a mind would see that which is imperishable, avyayam, see the undivided, that is the avibhaktam, and would see unity in diversity. And such a mind is 
such a form of knowledge is also very useful for highest attainment of Paravidya. The other two forms, which are Tamasic and Rajasic, are useful as well in the lower forms of knowledge, which is Aparavidya. Any questions about this? Any thoughts? Comments? In that case, we continue to verses 23 to 25. An act performed devoid of attachment, without attraction and aversion, by one desiring no fruit is called sattvic. That act, however, which is performed by one desirous of fruit, possessed with ego, with much exertion of many kinds, that is, rajasic, without foreseeing the result, loss, violence or capacity, the act that is initiated out of delusion is called tamasic. These three, three verses explain the three types of action. Attachment and aversion are two aspects that we experience all the time in our lives. At any point of time, you will find something is pleasant, something is unpleasant. You will like something or you will dislike something. You will enjoy or you will dislike. And this is this play of attachment and aversion, the raga, dvesha. So when you perform something out of raga, dvesha, that is attachment or aversion, it's very normal. Most of the time we are experiencing this. But when you do not experience raga, dvesha, and you do this act without even desiring the fruit or reward, such an act is sattvic. Now most of us may not have experienced such action. Most of the things we do, we do because we have a certain motive. If you go to work, you do that because you need money. And if you examine all the actions in your life, you will see most of the time there is some intention behind it. There are very few actions that we do without a reason. Sometimes you're just sitting and you're just enjoying maybe the nice weather, enjoying perhaps some flowers in your garden or on your terrace. And in that moment, you just think, hmm, it seems like very nice to just sit here and maybe do a little gardening, just pot around a little bit, you know. There's no particular reason for it. You just do it. You just enjoy it. There's no particular result that you're looking for. So... Performing action like your household duties. Now I'm well aware that most people do not like to do household chores. But if you are cooking or cleaning and you don't really have an aversion to it, nor 
Are you very attached to the idea of cooking and cleaning? And you don't really expect anybody to come and praise you and thank you for it. You're just doing it. And that would be sattvic action. But on the other hand, if you are performing those household chores, let's take the example of cooking. A lot of people have to cook every day and they don't get much gratitude from their family. They're not appreciated. If there is a desire for appreciation, then there is an ego involved. Then such an act will become rajasic. So that action where you are very keen on having some reward, whether it is in the form of money, the form of recognition, appreciation, that immediately brings hankara into picture. You put in a lot of effort and this is known as rajasik. Tamasik action is very interesting. When you perform something without really thinking about it, without, without really thinking about the result, or you don't care about the result, you're careless, or you go beyond your limit, you do something which is just totally beyond your limit, such action is called tamasic. It may appear just on first thoughts. But if I say, oh, without forcing results, if I'm not bothered about the result, isn't that sattvic? It sounds like that. It seems like that. I don't care about the result. That's quite different from sattvic. Here, in the tamasic action, one doesn't take care to do a good job of things. It's just done carelessly with the wrong attitude. And you don't care if you suffer a loss or if somebody's hurt or whether it's right or wrong. You just do something. So this kind of action is Coming out of delusion or ignorance is totally ignorant, and this is tamasic. Any questions, comments about form of actions? Uh, hello, Radhika Ji. Yeah. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. Um, like uh, the practices that we are doing, like meditation and uh, yogi practices, mm -hmm. we do for like a certain desire. And uh, what category that comes into, like sattvic or rajasic? That depends on what you're doing it for. If you say, um, I am doing it for a particular purpose. Um, for example, if someone says, I am doing this practice to help somebody else that would be tamasic okay. because everybody has their own karma their own samskaras and what practice you do would be for yourself your own self-development you cannot really help somebody else with that you can only help somebody else in the sense that you change in some way. But if you're doing something just for helping others, that kind of practice would be tamasic. If you're doing a practice in order to get something, you know we say that uh, you become like a beggar because you want this and you want that. You know, prayer where you're asking for, I don't know, house or money. And if you're doing a practice um, uh, for such reasons, 
then that would be rajasic. If you're doing practice purely because you just love to sit there and just hang out with yourself, that would be truly sattvic. Even a desire for development is a desire. But, caution there, big, big caution there, it does not mean that you give up the practice. Just because you think, hmm, Radhika Ji said now that, that the practice I'm doing is uh, Rajasik because I want to develop and I want to grow and that's also a desire and so I give it up. No, that's not what I mean. That's the last thing you give up. You have to reach a point in your development where you become so sattvic that you will even lose that desire for self-realization or for the end of suffering because you become a witness. You're just watching the show. I just explained it in the earlier verse when I say you arrive at a place where the mind has become so sattvic and you're watching and observing everything around you that you just like to do it and you're just doing it without a reason. That would be truly sattvic. But that's a long, long way to go. Most of the time, most people who are performing practices are doing it for rajasic reasons and some of them also for tamasic reasons. But as long as we have not reached a level of a sattvic mind, we may continue, we should continue to do practice, whatever kind of practice it may be, even if it is tamasic, even if it is rajasic. Do not give up any form of practice. Okay, thank you. Yes, that was... A good question. Um, I have been asked this uh, very often. Those who are reading a lot about Advaita, for example, they always say, oh, we don't need to do any practice because we are all pure consciousness, we are all Atman, and you just have to remember. So there's no need of doing because then you are the doer. You know, you you think you're the doer and, and actually there's no such thing as uh, doing. So they, they talk themselves in this kind of mental gymnastics that they do uh, into not doing any kind of meditation and invariably uh, what that leads to is it's also a tamasic state. So while there are different levels of sadhana, the reason behind why you're doing it, very few of us have come to the stage where you, where you would say, oh, I'm doing my practice. I'm just, I just love to meditate. I just love to sit there. I just love to hang out with myself and just be. Very few of us have reached that stage. So, keep doing it. Okay, so we should stop here and we continue next Friday. I hope that everybody has a nice weekend and um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye.